this. Ah, you already got us there. Oh, so that was your trigger. Um, so um, that's the slide that always reminds me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, if you check out our different socials, and Marcy just hit the record button, so we'll have this out on uh, YouTube in a, in a few days. We're generally pretty good about getting that turned around. Um, so if you follow us on YouTube, you can um, refer back to tonight's presentation at a future time. Uh, next month's speaker, uh, Woody Zool. Woody's um, going to be talking about failure to communicate. Um, you've probably seen and would uh, seen Woody before talk about uh, different topics, but um, I think this was a, this is a new one for him. So we're really excited to have him uh, join us next month for that. And uh, for those in the Indianapolis area, we are planning an in-person uh, meetup in June. So super excited about that. Uh, more details to follow. We're still trying to land on a place and, and all that good stuff, um, but we will keep you guys uh, posted. And uh, I'm really excited about seeing everyone face to face. And we are always looking for um, speakers. So if you or someone you know, uh, maybe you've heard them speak, or um, I, I know we've talked about like uh, we're kind of getting into conference season. If, uh, if you know anyone that wants to practice, uh, maybe a smaller audience for their upcoming uh, conference, then uh, please let them know. We'd be glad to consider that. And with that, tonight's speaker, uh, we've got uh, Dennis Stevens uh, joining us from uh, Leading Agile. Dennis, you want to give us just a 30-second uh, introduction to who you are? Sure. So I'm Dennis Stevens. I'm the co-founder and chief methodologist for a company called Leading Agile. Um, this is kind of the space that we operate in, trying to get um, more complex organizations to become uh, more adapt at responding to change in the marketplace, uh, helping them become more agile in their, in their ability to deliver. It's as much of a change management thing as it is a practice or technology thing. So a lot of what we're talking about tonight is sort of the change management angle on how we get executives to support and be interested in and desire the agile transformation work that we're also interested in. Nice. Thank you, Dennis. And uh, with that, I'm going to stop sharing. And Dennis, if you get your deck ready, then we will hand it over to you. How's that look? Looks great. Thank you. All right. So to get the slides from today's presentation, if you text executive to 1-844-414-9981, our marketing group, um, we'll get you the slides and probably give you an opportunity to join a mailing list and some other things to get other content with us. Um, we do a conference every year called Elevate Agile. I know we're making some of that content available to people that come through that as well. So hopefully you'll sign up and want the slides. Hey, I'm gonna do this, um, this uh, presentation, but I'm, I'm interested in some feedback and some dialogue along the way from everybody except for Leon. Um, I would really appreciate, uh, Leon's a, an old friend, sorry about that. He, he said he was gonna heckle me, so I was kind of teasing him on there. Um, but but um, perfectly open to conversations or questions as we're going. Uh, really interested in your experiences and how what we're talking about resonates with you so we can get a better group experience out of it, if, if you don't mind. Um, there's a couple of things that I think we all agree on that are just true, right? Um, organizations need to be able to respond to market speed sustainably. Um, we're not in the business of trying to have people do agile better or scrum better or product management better or DevOps better. All that stuff is important, but in order for organizations to actually be responsive to market at market speed, um, it takes more than, than just the practices side of things. The types of changes in alignment that we have to get requires executive support. We have to get executives to support changes in policy, changes in funding, changes in teaming, changes in expectations from people. We've got to do things like do a better job of throttling demand against our capacity of not churning uh, demand on a dime every day when the next customer calls or somebody yells louder. So we have to get the right types of organizational support to make um, agile teams effective. What's interesting is when we go start talking to people out there about um, about executives 
and what they believe about the agile stuff we're doing is a lot of people think that executives are just not competent, uh, that we'll get pushed back. Um, they just don't believe us. They're not willing to invest in it. They're not willing to support us. Um, executives, on the other hand, are not like deliberately trying to make our agile transformations fail. They want the things that we promise. Uh, what they might not see is how what we're doing helps them achieve their objectives. So I think the way that we go about um, enrolling executives or participating with leadership in a lot of cases is ineffective. Um, literally down in Miami two weeks ago, a group telling me that their CEO just deliberately wants their product development organization to fail. Like that's what they believe. And it just isn't possible. That's true, right? Um, what, what he doesn't want to do is he doesn't want to go do agile in a way that it doesn't help him successful be successful in his commitments to the markets and to his customers. And so there's, there's things around that we really have to wrap, wrap our heads around. From, from the experience of people in the group, I'm gonna just try this little question out there. Why do y'all think executives don't participate effectively in our agile endeavors and our transformation efforts? You don't want to get nice. Fundamentally, it's been my experience that uh, executives never really see the value return from the promises made from Agile. You know, the aspect of working smarter, not harder, doing more work, less time, generating more value, less work. Bureaucracy supersedes that. What purpose does that bureaucracy serve for them, Ken? That purpose is historical, Dennis. It's been there. Leading edge has bureaucracy. Think about it. Look at your back office. Now, make that agile. Okay. Why, why else do y'all think that agile doesn't work or executives don't participate in it? I don't know if we speak their language. I think they're interested in understanding the promise. We promise value, but they want to they want to see the metrics and the measurements. They want to see the value being delivered. The sooner, the better. Yep. I think for me, it's it's just not translated into their language and, and how they speak and act. So they've they've they're at they've been at a certain level for a while, and they they have metrics that they're uh, responsible for. They have big responsibilities, and um, so sometimes it's th what they're looking for is how can I leverage that to get me what I want or more things of what I want, right? Yep. So Leon, you could have done half the talk tonight. You do it better. <laughs> so I think, I think all those things, all those things are true and sort of lead down the path um, to, to why do executives cling to historical processes? Why do executives not want to um, invest in flipping to new models, even though markets are changing, technology is changing, the pace of change, is changing. Um, why do executives not buy in? So there's this interesting section I have, and I'm going to walk through these, give some examples, and ask for some feedback from y'all, see if any of these resonate. But what doesn't work to get executives to align and buy in and support the transformation? Um, telling them that if they were good executives, they would just trust the teams. You all seen this language, right? Give us everything needed to succeed and leave us alone. Um, we would be so much more successful if you would just be nice to us and trust us. There's a, there's a, a important thing that we learn about in management theory in the concepts of delegation and trust, and that trust starts with being trustworthy. Um, we can't tell people to trust the team and just delegate into us when we haven't given them a reason to trust the team yet. There's an interesting sort of gap that telling executives just trust the teams um, that is just a sort of a non-starter because the executive is the one whose fanny is on the line for the products and for the deliverables and for the interaction with the market. I mean, have you all tried this one or heard this used before by your scrum masters or people in the organization? Yeah? Yes, absolutely. And, and by the way, Forget about scrum masters. How about coaches? Yeah, just trust the teams. Just let's coaches, go do this. We'll be way better. Just trust the teams. Yep. Um, one of the things that comes up, and this one is interesting. We were in <clears throat> an OKR conversation with a client with another coach. And the coach said, one of the most important things is we got to let the coaches write their own OKRs. And the technology group at that same company was saying, we got to let the coaches decide how they're going to work. 
We got to let the developers decide how they're going to work. Let them pick their tools. Let them do their own thing. And the executive's going, that just doesn't work for me. I mean, I'm the one that gets in trouble if stuff gets put into the data center that doesn't meet our security requirements and, uh, and the data get or our, our PII gets um, stolen in the market or somebody hacks into our systems and takes our system down. I'm not okay with just every team deciding to work how they want to work. Um, I'm not okay with letting teams decide what they think is most important, whether it's aligned to my strategy or not. Again, it's a little bit of a delegation model, um, which is just letting the teams decide how to work and creating freedom for them is actually not going to fly with most executives. And it's not even actually necessary to achieve agility in most cases. But we talk a lot about in the industry how people ought to be able to self-determine their work, their value, what they're working on. Um, but there's a reason why executives have the jobs they have. They understand how to cast vision organizations, how to marshal resources. There's value that they bring. And they're not just going to let the teams decide how to work or what to work on. Um, it's a little bit like to just trust the teams, but it's another thing that just immediately, when we put this out there as an entry point for Agile, that makes executives less likely to want to support the initiative. Um, you'll get what you get when you get it. We're Agile now. We're going to build a backlog. Um, no idea when we're going to deliver it, how long it's going to take. It's impossible to really know anyway. And so we're just going to go do the best we can and hope that we hit it. It'll be the right quality. And you'll just have to deal with getting what you get. There's an awful lot of language out there in our industry about not making commitments, about not setting expectations, about not being able to um, operate within constraints of the market and the customer. We tell people, and this is what executives hear, you'll get what you get when you get it. And we have to be able to make and keep commitments and delivery of product to customers around contracts, around the dates that events start, Christmas comes, you know, the cotton starts growing in March. Um, things happen on a schedule and we have to be able to deliver value in those timeframes with those budgets. When we tell people you're not going to get to be able to tell me how much to spend to get what you want, um, that's just a non-starter. The reason why they cling to project management is project management makes promises that they can get this. Well, it's not perfect, at least the promise is there. Um, there are ways to use Agile to deliver on time, on schedule, on budget by um, varying scope and by changing the precision of the detail and by making driving down risk early and making trade-offs early. That are, it's more effective than we do with project management, but we don't explain the language of gain from Agile to executives. What they hear is you'll get what you get when you get it. Um, another thing we'll do is we'll send them books. Here's some books to read. Go read Gene, Kim, Gene Kim's book on, uh, on whatever the most recent one is. You know, go read this book. Go read that book. Here's some books to read. Look, it's in Harvard Business Review. Look, it's in Forbes. Look, all these people are talking about how great Agile is. And we give executives books to read. And we might make them want it, but they still don't support it. Um, they don't support it because those books don't actually tell them how to get there in their environment with the challenge that they have. We don't create safety for them in these transitions, I think. And so this, um, here's some books you need to read, here's some articles sort of stuff is not very effective in communicating with executives. Um, the other one's really interesting is let's go all do some servant leadership training. Let's change our mindset and let's all have the executives start to be agile themselves to model the behavior so the whole organization can be more agile. Right? Have you all tried any of these topics or seen these approaches and tried to align and engage executives in change? Only in guerrilla fashion. You know, one of the challenges you mentioned, Dennis, was project management. Project management does have value toward the organization because project management can speak finances and accounting finances drives the organization. Agile does not speak accounting. There needs to be a go-between. We've, we've not yet built that into the, what is it, the law of the network, if you will, hearkening back to the old days. Uh, so therefore, project management is still required, but somehow you have to fit your small team agile processes within 
the project management spear and then create a buffer, a blanket, if you will, to hide the activities from finance. Yeah, you know, I don't, I don't know. I'll, I'll tell you a funny story, Ken, sort of around that. But this was like 15 years ago. We were working with a big Canadian bank who was opening an, an internet bank in the US. It was one of the very first, we'll claim it was the first um, internet bank that was actually built end to end. And the, the Canadian bank was, um, had a huge, huge, heavy um, handed PMO activities. And they had like this guy that was in, responsible for this purchase, and this investment that we were running. And we were doing feature-driven development, um, uh, small team agile, building stable groups, bringing work to teams. Um, and we had like a whole floor sort of dedicated to this transformation of the platform using all agile techniques. Um, the, the guy that ran the PMO was so mad about it that he kept requiring us to produce his documents, his artifacts, all that sort of stuff. And so I hired three people whose jobs was every day to go across my boards and do that translation you're talking about. How do we turn this into the um, schedule performance index, cost performance index, um, quality metrics, risk, like all the things that we needed. And I need these reported out every single day. But my teams were operating off of whiteboards with stickies and three bar Kanbans drawn across the teams. And I had some big feature Kanbans driving integrations across these teams, right? So we're doing that and one day that PMO guy got so mad he came downstairs and erased all my boards and pulled all the stickies off the wall and goes, now how are you going to run your project? My first thought was, that's not a very responsible behavior from like a PMO executive at a major bank, right? But my second thought was, thank goodness I hired these three people to copy my walls down every single morning. And so, so we were able to reconstruct our boards in about 35 minutes from the work that group had put together. Um, so I thought that was pretty funny. You might, you might appreciate that. But yeah, we built that to support them. But I think, I think you're right. There's no reason why we can't speak that language and provide the same structured supports. I can actually deliver projects against a project plan more accurately with agile teams working from backlogs than I can um, uh, with a big Gantt chart plan and with late integration. Early integration gives me the ability to drive down risk earlier, identify where I need to create optionality earlier, and deliver value when we run out of time or money and deal with the resilience around um, competing concerns as we're doing those projects. Stable teams and agile, I can deliver better projects more reliably than I can with traditional project management. And you know, Mike and I both came out of the project management world a little bit. I helped write the, the software extension to the PMBOK for PMI explaining how to do some of that. So the, the knowledge is out there, but our agile community doesn't tend um, to use it very often. So I think it's interesting, it's a good point, but we don't tend to approach it from that angle. Um, what, what have y'all tried to enlist your executives that hasn't worked? Got like, got like 50 people on the call. I can look in chat too, that's kind of cool. I got, I, I sent them to conferences before. Go to this conference. Yep. Did that work? Mm, not, not, uh, I'm going to say rarely. I'm going to say rarely. Um, most of the execs ended up at the bar. Yeah. Hey, Jeff, here's one about a promise made is not a promise kept. I, I totally agree. I'm not, I'm not suggesting. I'm just saying that I can do a better job of delivering on high-risk learning endeavors when I have small batches and high-risk management and lots of feedback and the ability to adapt than I can when I'm integrating everything on the back end. Like to me, the difference between using agile and waterfall as a delivery mechanism is the agile is much more resilient to the risks that are inevitable. I will tell you, I haven't had an executive yet take a two day training, full two days. I'm zero, I'm over. Yeah, that's a good call, Jeff. That's, that's, the, that's the right conversation. I'm just reading the comments here from people. I've, I've, I have had, an executive take a two-day training. I've had two executives, at least, but they tend to be in startups, not in uh, not in large corporations. Yeah, you can do it better in a small startup with really dynamic people. Because here's the other thing: um, practices alone in a smaller organization are more likely to be successful than trying to solve agile with a practices-based implementation in a large organization. If you still have 
um, siloed functionality, no amount of practice is going to um, make this stuff work. So we end up building, talk about building relatively stable teams and tell the executives what's necessary to change in the design of the organization to get the results they want. I think one of the failure modes is we don't walk through um, what's going to be required for them to get the results that they want. I'm going to also say, I don't know that we ask them. Like we just sort of, yeah. like we, just- We start just, bottom up. Yeah, we just, like how about we talk to them? Yep. Yeah, so, um, hey, Cyril, why do you think they're too busy to make the effort? It's not that I think about it. It's that it's what they say. That's that's their excuse uh, m most of the time. Because um, what what I've what I try is that it, it, is reach them. Is say okay, you you need to 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 get some knowledge. You need. Uh, I want you to know what what you mean by agile. Okay, let, let's organize uh, a workshop. Let's uh, let, let's meet. Let's do something. And they don't have the time or they don't want to take the time about it because most of the time it's, I, I think it's, uh, uh, the, the point is about changing habits and changing habits, changing the way you work is costly. Uh, so, and, and, and it's scary. Uh, and, and, and that's what I, that, that's what I tend to see. Uh, they, they use the word agile, they want organization. It's, it's fashionable to be agile. But once you have to make the effort to understand what's going on in your organization, that's another story. So that, that's why that, that's what I was trying to say. Yeah, I think it's I think that's I think that's interesting. I, I think that um, it's a little distracting. Um, I think I think that it is um, we haven't created a hole in their heart to desire it to achieve what they think matters most to them. And so they think it's somebody else's problem. Right, so we have to make we have to create the hole in their heart for it, and then they'll support it, and they have to know that it's their best possible path to achieving what they're trying to achieve. Like that is the, that that's the shift we have to begin to make, because you're right. If if they're in this point where they don't think it's their problem, they don't think they have to participate, they think it's somebody else's problem, something that somebody else is going to do for them, um, and 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 they don't understand what it takes and the benefit to them. We don't create a hole in their heart, desire for it. They are not going to participate, and we're not going to get the results that we want. Yeah, so, yeah. That is, I think it's you, you pointed something important. It's what's the value, what's the benefit for them? Because at the end, as they are executive, they, they are very uh, pragmatic. It's like what's in for me, uh, and I want to see some kind of results. So what what's the benefit I can get from that? What's the what's the value for me? And and most of the time. It, it takes some time to understand this value, to, to get the, 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 this, this curve in order to understand it. And uh, how can we reach them quickly, efficiently, in order for them to make these efforts in order to invest into it? Yeah, I, I, really, I really like what you said. I mean, execs are about results. Um, shouldn't they be? Well, that's what they're paid to produce. And it's their job. they're actually... They're actually paid to produce results today and in the future. They care about the health of the company over time. They care about the ability to produce results efficiently and effectively. Um, they just don't understand how this helps them get there. And the language that we use to describe it and the benefit to them. Some people are talking about the two-day workshop. We like to do an executive two-day workshop. They don't need to go to a scrum master class or a product owner class. Um, we've got- They, don't, we've they got, don't have time to do that. It, and, it, and it serves no purpose to them. Right, um, we, we, we run, in most of our transformations, we run an executive master class, which is two days worth of content, it's over four days, and we get tons of engagement, and I don't use a single agile word in the four days of training. We talk about systems produce what they're designed to produce, who's responsible for the design of the system. What is it about your system that gets in the way of your organization's ability to respond? What dependencies, um, lack of decision frameworks, inability to delegate, lack of trustworthiness, lack of understanding of your customer. All these things can be solved with Agile, but we're spending two days building a hole in their heart for wanting it and then showing them how to get there, right? So we literally attempt not to use a single Agile word unless somebody Standing brings that pain it up. Point. That's, that's right. Their pain point is not that we're doing Agile or DevOps or Scrum. They may have read about it and want to understand where it fits in, 
and I can tie it back, but executives are responsible for the design of the organizations and organizations produce what they're designed to produce. So we got to teach them that they're getting the results they've got because the organization is designed that way. We've got to talk about the challenges with that type of design versus team-based incremental iterative design and delivery and how we can give them more of what they need, not language of loss, but language of gain, the benefit to them to achieving their outcomes. So they desire it and are willing to try it, right? So there's like, I'm gonna walk through that in some detail, but I think it's a really important sort of difference, right? Language of gain in their language, um, heading down that path. So we talk about, all these points kind of came up, um, care about what they care about. You're right, they don't care one bit about how good we are at Agile or Scrum or technical practices or um, any of the things that we want them to be good at. Uh, what they care about is, we have to understand what they care about. What they care about is getting results. We have to speak in their language. We have to speak to them in things that matter to them and, and give them work to do that's relative to the work that they're responsible for doing so we don't get relegated behind some project manager or PMO that's leading our agile transformation, right? We have to figure out how to create safety in the organizational change and the transformational efforts that are necessary for executives to be willing to try it because otherwise they're gonna cling to what's always worked for them because they're only two to three years from retirement and they're not gonna fail on the back end or something, um, you know, some hyperbole there. And then when we get a shot at it, we have to demonstrate results within the safety in their language and results they care about. Make sense? Does this resonate with y'all at all? See, these are my four topics I wanna to talk to and discuss. Yeah, especially speaking their language. I think we miss that a lot of times that we don't put ourselves in their shoes. Um, yeah. And I, I really think if we start off with that, I think we might get some better engagement. The why and the where is so much more important than the how. And when we get pushed into a corner, we probably tend to fall back on the how. We fall back on the thing that we're comfortable with and believe and know, and, and we try to create safety for them in a way that it creates safety for us, right? But that doesn't create safety for them. The how doesn't make them feel safer. What creates safety for an executive is the why and the where, right? So what are we gonna do? How are we gonna get there? But I don't wanna know like the details of the, of the work I want to know how you're going to make the transformation safe for me. So care about what they care about. Yeah, and it's the empathy conversation. What do executives care about? What do they get paid to do? Why do they, why do they make money and get paid a lot of money in organizations? Because they're good at getting organizations to make money, be successful in the market, and have in the past demonstrated the ability to produce healthy firms that can do that over time, right? Most People that make it to the executive level um, haven't destroyed the teams they work for, failed in delivering things, and not been responsible for the money. Like they understand how to execute to produce these types of results. Do y'all think that's true or not true in your experience with executives? I think if you, if you don't know how to manage a budget, you're not going to be an exec for long. Yep. Any other feedback? Do y'all disagree with this? Like, should they care about how happy our teams are and how good our collaboration is and um, and how many teams of Scrum Masters and um, how clean our code is? Like, should they care about that? No, I would agree with you. These are the bullet points. I think each organization is unique and executives and organization are there for different reasons. And they may hit one or two of these. Um, in my limited experience, I've rarely seen an executive that's hitting all three of these. They may be successful yes. in the market and making money because <laughs> they're, they're beating down the health of the firm or something like that. It, it, well, and, and you know what? Sometimes, Bob, um, they're actually aware that they're doing it. Like they're aware of all three of the levers. And they may be really, really good at beating the hell out of stuff and getting it out this month. And then next month, they may be paying attention to the health of the firm. Right, and then every, and we always go, well, why did you care about that last month? Well, because I was trying to stay in business, right? And now that we're in business, and I got a little bit of runway, we're gonna go focus on that. Um, but if we're not looking at their activities as if they're rational people 
that are competent at these things and understand what it takes to get there and care about these things, we don't know how to have a conversation with them about what we're trying to do, right? Because and, I can help Agile, oh, go ahead. And I, I was gonna say, I'm sorry to interrupt. I think that we think it's self-evident, right? So we're transformed, so it's self-evident. All I gotta do is have five minutes with them and they should be transformed. I would go so far as to say, and this is gonna be a little bit hyperbole to spark, to strike a nerve. Um, I would say that we're actually sometimes naive about the purpose of the firm and what it takes for the firm to be successful. And we are experts at what it takes for teams to deliver software when all the conditions exist appropriately in the organization, right? But I think that sometimes we're naive in the interest and pressures. I have people come to me every day and go, wouldn't it just be better if we took our best people and put them in positions to train everybody else how to do this stuff? And they go, yeah, but I've got 107 clients I'm trying to deliver to right now. And, uh, and I actually have to deliver that work at the same time. So you're, it's an impossible problem. That would be a good solution. It just doesn't work. Yep. But you could actually, I'm sorry, think about it, taking a product from, taking a page from a product owner's book and really getting into that, see them as a customer or a stakeholder and getting into their space and trying to understand, as you've been talking about the entire night, what are your pain points? What problems are we trying to solve for you? But really having that product mindset versus we want this organization to be agile and here's how we think we can do it. Yeah, I think one so, of the things that, I'm sorry, Dennis. I think one of so the good. things that we tend to forget is that it, the, the company itself is a moving puzzle that's always constantly redirecting its pieces. And even though our assignment last week, when we spoke with the executor, uh, the executive or the manager or whoever, there may have been major things that changed that we have no information on. So their focus has changed as well. So when we bring up conversations or need to address certain things, and then we get kind of sidestepped a little bit, we forget that, wait, their objective may have changed temporarily too. Yep. Most of the successful executive conversations that, that, that I have um, starts with getting access to the last board report. Or the last, or their market positioning paper, or their investment reports, and being able to tie what we're talking about back to these angles, which what they're there for. We'll talk about agile as a technique, as a a way of doing work, um, can help us increase predictability or quality or early ROI. It can help us lower cost and drive efficiency. It can help create innovation. It can help create improved product fit. These are all things that um, if you're trying to make more money or have success in the market or improve your health in the firm, these are all things that can help us get there. These are things an executive would be able to have a conversation about. Maybe not all six of them at the same time. Maybe not all three levers at the same time. But these are the types of things I can talk about how Agile helps us be more predictable. Talked a little bit about that before. By operating in incremental fashion, by doing riskier things early, by exploring and creating options to achieve success, creating tremendous transparency in our progress towards those goals. I can actually deliver projects on time, on schedule, better than I can in a waterfall fashion. I can run a budget and a scope and a schedule more accurately with better risk management and with agile teams delivering incrementally and iteratively. I might have to define more of the backlog up front, be more thoughtful about our scope and more transparent about our progress. Like I'm not discovering all the scope late, but I'm delivering in an agile fashion. I can be more predictable. Agile always when done well will drive quality up because we get really, really good and we tend to automate things we do all the time. So all the testing at the end of every sprint, the integrating of every feature, the deploying to test environments and development environments all the time, we're gonna get really good at that because we're doing it frequently. We're not just doing it once and it's somebody else's problem at the end. We're going to make it be expensive to the people that are doing the work, and we're going to get really good at it. Quality will inevitably go up. That same form or fashion of making value flow, balancing capacity and demand, optimizing throughput of features through my system will help me get to early ROI. We can sit there and show them very clearly that working on 10 things at once and delivering all 10 things at the end doesn't create the same optionality for them as working on two things at a time and delivering them in one, those two things in one fifth the time. 
It gives them more optionality. It reduces the pressure on the rest of the organization. We'll actually be able to move faster and get more clarity. Like we can show them the flow of value through their system as opposed to working on everything all at the same time. They'll understand that. We don't have to explain that we're doing with stand-ups and scrum and scrum masters and product owners and backlogs and stories and features. None of that's relevant. It's what if I could deliver um, one fifth of, of everything uh, next month, the next fifth, the next month, the next fifth, the next month, and you had some adaptability around the rest of it. The same things that give me predictability are going to give me early ROI. The lower cost comes from um, reducing the overhead and the churn, not building things I don't need not having to park things that I built part way and had to rip out of the system and go. There's all kinds of things we do that make it expensive to build software in our current models. If we operate in this fashion, I can drive significantly more efficiency and, and we can deliver on that. These are promises we can make and keep and we can connect them to making money, success in the market and the health of the firm. Getting good at understanding how to talk about these items on this page in a way that viscerally matters to an executive and they'll have, you can have a conversation with them, a conversation about strategy. Dennis, what about cost, you know, as you talk about reducing cost of delay and, and, and changing up your opportunity cost as well, right? Yep, so all that I think falls in early R and lower cost. That's exactly right, I'm gonna get, we'll, we'll go into that. How do you turn these in to dollars? Yeah, that's a very, very good topic. I think the term cost of delay, by the way, became very popular in the agile industry particularly in Kanban after David started using it. I don't think my CFO is sitting around talking about cost of delay. So just, just there's, it, it can be jargony in the conversation, um, but I can talk about efficiency and waste. I can have the same conversation in words that are not jargony to my CFO, my PMO and my CEO, right? So that's, it's good topics. So I would just talk about it a little bit differently. Hey, Ken, this one about lower costs. There is that budget blocker again that can be a tripwire to failure for overall delivery. Change management controls are essential across multiple sides of the organization. Talk a little bit about what you're, what you're thinking there. One of the challenges when going to in front of an organization, in front of, I'm sorry, one of the challenges in going in front of any executive saying, I'm going to lower your cost, prove it. Yeah, you, you can better have all be kinds to, of models. Prove it. You better be able to cash every check that you write in this conversation. Okay. So if I walk in and tell you that I'm going to reduce your cost or improve your your efficiency, I'm going to take a slice and go prove it in it, and I'm going to do it in a measurable way that the CFO will support. If you can't do that, it's a waste of time. So I think that's I think I think the point you've got is true. I think sometimes you walk in and say, Agile tells us that it will lower cost but we don't actually do anything differently except for throw some practices in there. And we still have all the overhead, all the silos, all the burdens. That's, so we tell them. You, you have no controls then over lowering your cost. You can only lower a right. cost over the fraction that you have control over. Now, that's, right. that's still not the overall cost. Yeah, so, so I wouldn't suggest that we would go in and say that Scrum can fix it. I would go in and say, if we build organizations that are aligned with capabilities, relatively stable, persistent teaming structures, and build the right governance model and integrate decision-making into the governance model and create the conditions for these agile teams to actually operate, like if we do the work around it, I can reduce your cost by 20 to 40%, and I've done it again and again and again. If you think you're going to get that result by going and teaching some people some scrum and operating from backlogs, you're, you're dreaming, right? So if you want the results that you desire, Here's what must happen to get there. If you want to keep doing the same thing you're doing, you're going to continue the same result you're getting. Your organization is producing exactly what it's designed to produce. And no amount of practices that we can install at the delivery team level is going to solve any problem you've got. So I agree, I agree with you. I agree with you. It's just that, you know, in my mindset, you know, agile organizations law the small team. The organization is huge. Now, I mean, granted, startups, different story. But if you've got any kind of organization that's got, say, more than 50 people, revenues uh, or sales, maybe more than, you know, three, 400 million annual, I mean, you're running into what we'll call the silos. Not all of those silos are agile in their organizational concept. 
Yeah. So you, you can't control the cost there, but yet they can influence or impact your agile, your agile performance. Yeah. Are you having that conversation with your executives about what must be true <laughs> to get the results that you want? I've been doing this because, battle because, since about 2010. So, and I'm failing miserably. So, so we have, we have a case study um, of over 20,000 people and we cut 30% of the cost out of their delivery organization across 20,000 people in a manufacturing centric organization. But we didn't do it by putting in agile practice. We did it by fundamentally restructuring the design of the teams and the organization, changing how they budget and do strategic funding across their organization, and then changing how they measure and deliver results. We kept all of their PMO controls in place, but we readjusted them to work with incremental and iterative delivery. And we got rid of layers and layers of overhead necessary to hold broken organizational pieces together across those functional silos. We did it by doing a small slice first and three years later doing it across the whole organization. And we've okay. done that again and again. So we left the realm of agile and we've gone to back to classics, 19 organi 1980s organizational change management and production improvements to get some of those savings. So you're asking me though, why don't executives listen? They don't listen because if you think Agile is going to give them any of those things about making money, success in the market or the health of the firm all by itself, without those, without change management, without organizational redesign, without creating, without producing dependencies, without changing the flow of the organization, they're not going to get it. So you're right. If we, if we, if we think that the Agile conversation is about better teaming, better collaboration, just trust the teams, and you're going to get better results, they're not going to participate. So I agree with you. Yeah, and just remember, though, in terms of our agile concepts, where we've come from, it's all about small teams, small teams for delivery to satisfy or to excite the customer. Now we're into whole scale organizational change management. You know, that that's like going from my little three person dev team up to a McKinsey type approach. Yep. So you got to you, you have to build it a little bit of time. But but here's the thing. I'm going to move on in a second, but I think it's important. Um, that's why you need executives to support what you're doing because agile teams can't be effective if the environment isn't conducive to them actually delivering value to the customer. We have to create the conditions where they actually connect. That's why you can do it in a small firm, but in a big firm, it's hard. So for those things that must move fast to move at market speed, not everything, those things that must move fast, we must create different conditions. And now you're having an executive conversation about why they would support it and allow us to lead it. And so we're back to the executive again, and now talking about the small slice to prove it. That's right. So this is, so this talk- Do you see the iterative develop, do you see the iterative approach that's going on here? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I put, is there, is there a problem with it? I mean, is, is there, like, what is, what is your concern or challenge? You seem to be well, um, dissatisfied. Well, well, well let me say, uh, I think he's largely dissatisfied, but let me just say, um, what, what's worked for me in the past is that if you've had success in their model before, so what's worked for me in the past is that if you've delivered, um, you know, projects in the past on time, on budget, or have a success with that, then you have some, you, you know, then, then you have some trust with the executive, right? Then some, the executives right. there and just say, look, I'd like to expose you different ways of delivery, different ways of getting to the same outcome, just in a, in a little different way. And so an yeah. exec might trust you if you've had prior success and exec's aware of that. Yeah, if you haven't, they're not going to trust you. If you can't, and if, and if you get a shot at it, you better go deliver it, measurably improve it so you get a shot at a bigger slice and a bigger slice and a bigger slice. I totally agree um, with, with, with your point, Bob. Um, so I'm not suggesting that you go tell them to transform a full organization overnight. I'm just saying the first one here is let's speak in his language. Make it matter to him in a way that matters to him. The second bullet, or, or, or understand his concerns and how to connect to his concerns. Second one is speak in his language. And the language of business is about a changed organization, the value of the work that's going through the system or market success. It's not about how many people are agile, but it's about operating efficiency. It's about productivity, value and flight. It's about financial return and winning in the market. So what we wanna be able to do is talk about why we're doing these things, productivity, quality, we're going to be able to turn those things into dollars and, and benefits, business benefits that matter to the executive. 
So as we go have these conversations, um, we have to be able to articulate how it's going to be successful for them. So why do I want to do small agile teams? Well, here's the problem. Um, small agile teams allow us to deliver incrementally iteratively. But we have to create the conditions for them to tie it all together. So there's probably more overhead we have to put in place to manage that. If we can get an, the organization structure set up right in their governance model, we can get work to flow through in a way that helps us drive down risk, create transparency, improve throughput, and, um, and create more clarity in your options and trade it. And we're gonna end up with more market success. I can measure all three of those things and have a conversation with the executive without ever talking about agile. So he's gonna be participating in the conversation from this sort of a model. Do customers want incomplete products? Do they truly understand what they're getting? Is the minimum viable product truly viable? Can we support those when they get out in the wild? I personally experienced this rolling downhill to customer service. Yes, yeah, so I mean, anything done poorly, Daniel, like delivering, you have to take the whole product experience into account as you're delivering it, right? Um, the conversation around how do we get product people to have the craft to slice their learning and their risk mitigation and driving good and fast achievement pick two is not accurate either. I can do it good, fast, and at cost. It's just, it's really interesting, the jargon around that. Um, um, we can reduce the overhead of poor quality, um, defects, churn in the system, the cost of working on 10 times more things than we have capacity to work on that leads to this massive overhead. I'm gonna spend the same amount of money building the product I did before, but I'm gonna spend a lot less money dealing with chaos and defects and rework. I can make your product, if I can make your productivity, your efficiency go up dramatically. I can improve your CapEx dramatically with Agile. As Agilists, we should, should be really clear to us how that happens and how we can do that. And we ought to be able to explain that to executives because they would like that because it's not good, fast and cheap pick two. We can do all three. We can do it better, faster and cheaper because the system you've got has tons of dependencies and overhead and compensating controls and broken stuff built in. If our agile teams were set up to be successful, a lot of the cost around the ecosystem could be reduced. Do y'all see how we do that with agile teams? Like as agilists, we should certainly be able to clearly see that, right? What are you thinking, Chris? I see you shaking your head. Finding the button. Um, I, I guess in my experience and spending time at the team level, you can only do so much there. And so- totally, totally agree. Yep, if we don't get the executives to support the things around it that are necessary for the teams to be successful, your teams won't produce the results that you want. Mm -hmm. You can't do it at the team level. Exactly. And I see a lot of um, people really working well at the team level, but until you kind of step back and look at that entire system, right? So that, that's where you're like, you got to have the buy-in, but you also have to get that, like you, you, you're talking about seeing the whole system, not just the yeah. individual pieces. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, we have to be able to get the executives to see it too. Yes, and model it and, in a way that you can. And, and desire it, yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's an important part about that then, which is one be able to show them how we're going to get there because they don't feel safe in it. They don't understand how the delivery team is gonna connect up and they don't understand how all the compensating controls they've built around their fractured ecosystem historically are not gonna be necessary. So part of the story is to get them to understand um, that in order, so this is like a, this is like a, um, a little bit of a cycle, but um, to find the reason, come up with a credible plan to make the changes necessary for agile teams to be successful. We can do it in a relatively small slice to create safety. To your point exactly, Bob, you've got to go do it once. You need some way to go prove it. They're not going to flip everything overnight. We want to be able to incorporate their feedback to understand what they need to create safety for them and the change. And then we have to be able to connect the results we're doing to their success. So I'm gonna take a small slice, run a project, I'm gonna go run it. I'm gonna prove this model works end to end 
and I'm going to talk about what it would take to put those conditions in place across a broader part of the organization. And I'm going to enlist their help in making those changes take place and building out the bigger plan. Because you can't solve this at the agile delivery team level. Is that is this resonating a little bit? Does it seem out of out of touch? Does it seem possible to change the conversations? I think there's a there's an element of safety that you haven't touched here. And maybe it's the size of the organization I work in, but at the executive level, they have the ability to push red button and make things happen. Just to walk in and say, stop, we got to do this. And I yep. think that's an element of safety too, helping them understand that what you're building or what you're trying to work with them on doesn't lock them out of that ability to do that. Because in some cases, it may. It's necessary. And, and yes. Yeah, it's the, the, the resilience to them having to pivot overnight. But there's another thing there that I work a lot on when I'm talking to executives, Bob. They do that because that's because making crisis is the only way to reliably get anything through the system. The only things that move through in a, in a reliable way are the things that are the crisis. And so they manage okay. by elevating the next crisis and the next crisis and the next crisis. If they had the alternative of not having to create a crisis every single time to get something through, but could actually move it to the top of the backlog and get it through predictably, they would start to trust the system. So I'm gonna give them a path and talk about how to help them get there. And they're gonna, because they, they actually don't like working in crisis either, because they know that this crisis lights up the next four crises, they'll have to clean up some stuff later. When I worked with Ross Perot one time, um, back in the 90s, I was in a room with him and Ross goes, um, who's going in to clean up this, uh, this problem with AT&T? And my boss goes, Dennis and his team, and Ross goes, okay, that's great, that's great. We'll get this problem solved. He goes, who's going in to clean up the mess they'll leave behind when they get it done? And I'm thinking, that is not a desirable approach to doing it. That's absolutely right, because the system isn't resilient to changing. Then we have to just blow everything up to solve one thing and then blow it up the next time and blow up the next time. We know how to design organizations with relatively persistent teaming structures, with um, work flowing and really, really effective risk management built in. We know how to build organizations that are resilient to those kinds of shifting demands. So we should help executives see that and desire it because those are the conditions that are necessary for us to get these agile teams to operate as agile teams and not just in complete soul crushing chaos all the time. Mm -hmm. right? I, I think here you, you said something interesting, Dennis, is going back to what we were talking before about creating value and in the same time, uh, being able to, to show trust in, in this change that, is, uh, that, that we're operating. And uh, working on uh, getting them convinced that we can get a small project and showing that the value that we can create from a small project is uh, finally uh, going to let us build bigger projects. And because obviously they, they're not going to have a leap of faith, never. That's uh, right. So that's right. And, 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 and that I, I, I think there's a word for that is like, or oh, we, we use that here, uh, I'm in Peru, so we use the quick wins, you know, say, okay, we take a small project uh, that gives you enough value, but is not that critical. And I'm gonna show you that it works. And once we get that, uh, we, we, we start to get the domino effects and uh, we are able to, to create trust and uh, implement agile the way we want, because they see that there's value at the end. That's, that's what they want. They want to shoot, they want to like, show me the money, no? That, at, at the end, that's the path. Yeah, it's like, it's like judo or jujitsu, Cyril. It is, mm -hmm. what's the next move I get to get them to respond to it, to get to the next move, get them to respond to it, to the next move, to finally get them in a position to do the thing I've been trying to do all along, right? Mm -hmm. You can't pick that giant person up and throw them all at once. But if you're very thoughtful about how to take each win and stack it up to prove the things you want to prove, then you, you, you get there at the end. So there's this, how do executives operate? Um, results, um, money, the performance of the system. Um, they know they have to do something different. They know it in their bones. But we're not walking in with a, what is it? How are we going to get there and prove it? So this, this slide here about creating safety for them in the mm -hmm. change is a really important sort of thought process to get into with them. So we're going to go prove it. I'm going to prove the next thing. There's one in here that says, what about managers that don't want to change? Um, again, that's just judo, man. It's just down it's just down the stack some. And so you either um, um, get them to change 
or you make them not be relevant in the decision-making process at some time. Um, or you put them in a position where it doesn't matter if they're agile because there's some parts of the organization you may never pivot. And there's, there, it's, all, it's all organizational mechanics and convincing people and moving them. But if we're very thoughtful about it with our plan, using our feedback, getting people to believe something different they believe so we can move them a little at a time, always connecting what we're doing to the success of the executives. Like if we learn how to play this game, we can create companies where agile can be successful. Right? What I see, and, what, I, what I see a lot is that we're not partnering with execs enough. We, I feel like sometimes as agilists, what I see is almost a transactional relationship. In other words, I have this plan. All I need you to do is approve it, and then I'm good. Like I, I won't talk to you for couple, like months. <laughs> and and so and sometimes I feel like we also give up if an exec asks like some reasonable like things, like reasonable things from us. Um, it's yeah. like, nope, nope, I'm giving up. I'm not, I'm not going forward with this. Like, you just need to approve it and then I'll go and just trust me. And uh, so I've seen that, I've seen that a lot. And I feel like well, if you're passionate about Agile in your organization, why are you giving up so easily? I mean, yeah. partner with your exec. And, and, and I mean, like if, if you truly are passionate about it, you shouldn't be giving up that easily. We, we had a conversation between one of our coaches and executive recently that I was involved in and we helped pivot the conversation part with you, but the executive is like, like, what is your goal? I'm going for 30% growth. And the consultant goes, you don't really want 30% growth. What you really want is the guy goes, no, let me be pretty clear. <laughs> like, like, like what I promised my, my, my board is 30% growth. Yep. Like, like if you can't help me connect to that, I'm not interested. Well, I think you don't understand what you really want are happy employees that will, but I'm, I'm like, hold this, hold on a second. <laughs> he wants 30% growth. What has to be true to get 30% growth? We're going to be able to deliver these new products and these markets that we don't fully understand in a pretty rapid pace and pivot adapt as we go. Okay, for that to be true, what has to be true? We've got to have this in place, right? Okay, well, the only way that we know how to do that is with these agile teams. Like, you can't do it with the stuff you're doing there. You've got to get to these agile teams. So it's not, no, you don't want that. It's like, perfect. In order to do that, this has to be true. In order for that to happen, this has to be true. So I'm going to show you how this creates that, which leads to that, which gets you that result. Right. And then we went and proved it in a slice. So I mean, it's, it's just interesting how we talk about it and we don't understand the psychology of our executive, the most important person that we need to create the conditions for our teams to work. And we're not thinking about how to create a hole in their heart and a desire to support it sometimes. So can so I just, sorry, yes. can I just clarify? So you're um, demonstrating what can be done versus doing a comparison of the current state um, with the possibility, right? Your current state may be waterfall. So the data of running waterfall projects and then comparing that to agile projects, or, or are you just showing the possibilities? Is that what you're saying? So so I, I think that we can build that sort of data and produce those types of results at the end of the day. But I, I think if you're talking about um, like I can get better predictability. I get better quality. Like I can measure those in my typical projects. I get better cost, a better, more accurate cost performance index with agile. And if I can show those things that matters, but it matters more to the PMO than it does to the executive. Those are means to an end. I've got to make one more hop, Audrey. I got to connect that to why that executive is going to get his promotion. I'm sorry, his bonus at the end of the year. Right. Um, and then I have to show all the people in the stack under that CEO how them participating in it is going to get them promoted because they're going to help the CEO do the thing that helps him get his bonus at the end of the year, right? So it's very much the psychology of the system that we're talking about. Yeah, Margarita, I agree. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an organizational influence approach. I don't know that it's sales. It's, it's helping them reconstruct their mental models from what they've clung to in the past to have something new that will help them be successful, right? And if we have to have their support, we're only going to get their support by making it matter to them. Me, Dennis, I'm always selling. I know, I know, Leon. People may not be buying. People may not be buying, Dennis, but I'm always selling. Yeah. Well, eventually they'll buy. So, so the last one then is demonstrate results. As we're dealing with an executive, we got them to want it. We're in their language. We're connecting to what they value. Um, we've built a plan. 
And now we have to be able to continually show how the plan we're doing, the progress on the roadmap and the transparency of the work, the examples and simulations of successes in their business, kind of where Bob was going earlier, show them where it worked and show it again. And then we have to connect that to value. We are closing those, uh, we're getting key results that you didn't get in the past faster. So Audrey, I could compare standard project management techniques to this agile approach when done well, and I can do a better job of connecting the work, the critical work to the OKR and responding and reducing risks. I can close capability gaps more frequently and with more optionality than I can in a giant waterfall project. Um, and I can show throughput and quality improvements that I couldn't get to. So I'm, I'm giving them value and language that matters to them directly from the results of the coaching and agile that we're putting in place the organization. This then fuels that cycle of them wanting more of it because they understand how what we're doing gets them there. So it is, it's a, it is a sales approach. It is an influence approach to bring people along and get them to care. Did I miss something that Dan, everybody said, good job, Daniel. Hang on, I can read Daniel's message. Yeah, yeah. If, if, we go and, if we go and train everybody in and start doing stand-ups, but operate the way we've always operated, you're gonna get the same results you're gonna get. So yeah, so it's not agile in name only. And the only way you move away from agile in name only is to get ex the people that design the systems we operate in to be willing to influence the organization to be designed differently. Like you don't fix this by getting better at your scrum teams. Or, or you don't fix this by, or communicate to execs by saying how many story points you delivered. Yeah, it's, it's irrelevant, right? It has to be it has to be at the point of results that, that matters to them. And there's a really, really cool thing. And Audrey, you were kind of leaning this. The person with the best data wins, right? When you can demonstrate success and tie it to financial value, which is one of the things that Ken said right up front. Like we have to tie it to financial. The reason why the PMO wins is because they're talking dollars and cents and outcomes, even though it's messy and it's, we can do that. We can have the same results but do it better by delivering incremental and iteratively to an organization, driving risk down early, people understanding our customer, um, driving quality into the system. Like the things that Agile produces for us help us get those results. So I wanna be able to, in my executive conversation, um, understand what matters to the executive. I wanna be able to talk in the language of the business. I wanna be able to make a plan and show how we're going to get better results there. Then we go do the work and demonstrate the results, slice at a time, over time, earning the trust of the organization to move there. This is how you get executives to totally support and buy in. And it's a journey. Like I said, it's a judo or jujitsu flip, right? It takes time and you gotta be kind of intentional about it. It'd be better, and I know some of us feel like it's just moral. Well, if you just worked better and trusted us, everything would operate better, but we have to look at it from where they're coming from. They're not going to pivot. So this sort of incremental and iterative model um, we'll sort of walk you through that. So I'd like a little bit of a summary slide here. Um, so base it on a business case, make it matter to the business, build an outcomes-based plan, tell them what changes we're going to make, and it's not agile in name only. It's not, I'm just going to go train some people, or I'm going to rename my current SDLC and use backlogs instead of requirements, All right? Um, set up a cadence of review, um, to review progress and engage executives in a, in a purposeful way. This is not a status report. This is, these are the organizational changes that are getting our way. These are things that you're responsible for as the designer of my system that make it hard for you to get more results that you want. Help me make the next change. What do you need to see from us? And do you need us to prove so we can get the next change in place? And then we continue to refine the plan and deliver on the business case. We have to always get the results. So this kind of thinking and this progression is what it takes to get executives to care about Agile. No amount of moral um, uh, positioning or um, uh, putting up signs and emails and letters and sending people to conferences is actually gonna create the conditions that are necessary for our Agile teams to be successful. So um, this is sort of the process and the conversation it's been kind of interesting. This went a little bit differently. Yeah, constantly communicating, Margarita. I agree entirely. Why is Ron laughing at me now? No, he's laughing at me. Oh, abscess. Oh, I see. That's that's appropriate, Ron, to laugh at Liam. Exactly. 
always appropriate. Um, so that's kind of, so that, that's, that's like the frame of the talk. Um, I think it's interesting. I do believe that we have more ability to be empowered as agile team people. And some people just want to run the agile teams or just want to be product master, product owners. And I think that's great. But if we actually want to get executives to buy in and support the conditions that are necessary, there is a game of change management, an organizational change that has to be there. And we have to be able to connect into those efforts. The organization, you cannot solve organizational agility or executives caring about your transformation um, at the delivery team level. I think that's true. So what we have about we have about 10 minutes. What what questions about about four minutes? What questions or Topics or conversation can we have while we've got a few minutes? A little bit of a quick lean coffee around the room thing. Thoughts, I mean, I, thoughts I, on the, pre thoughts I, on I the presentation? Wanna, yeah, I was gonna just say, I think oftentimes uh, what I've seen is like lone agilists, right? The lone agilist in the wilderness going up to the, the 19th floor for the executive boardrooms, right? And, and I often don't see that work because it's like a lone person. And I would really, really recommend you getting other advocates in your organization that are interested in change. And so if I'm an, I'm an executive and there's one person coming to me, I'm like, just you? Um, but if I got a team coming with me and better yet, a team across the organization that's interested in this, right? I, you know, I'm going to be going like, wow, this is serious. Like people are interested in this now. Um, and so I've had more success with when a team of folks came to an exec um, looking for, for something like this versus just a, a lone person. Yes. Hey, um, Cyril, um, Candace, will you get Cyril's email address, please, and get him the deck? Candace Chup is online. Cyril, if you get her your email address, she'll, she'll connect you. Um, yeah, and I like, I, I totally agree. Building a guiding coalition, Leon, building your advocates. Like I said, it's, it's, an organiz, it's organizational judo, right? It's gaining enough mass and getting out over the front foot enough that, that, you, can, that you can execute the next move. Um, and, and it is an organizational change strategy. Um, there is a, there's a book out there um, by Daniel Pink, Jeff, that we're all always selling, right? So a great scrum master is is selling the value of his team, creating conditions. These are the things that are necessary. A great scrum master is a great influencer, right? Because we're not asking for money for something that isn't valuable. We're, we're advocating to create the conditions for the organization to be more successful. That's a very different place than being like a salesman. Um, so it's a change agent or an evangelist is a very different position um, than being a salesman, but it is like the act of selling. Just to, just to go back real quick, Dennis, and, and <clears throat> from this perspective of your talk here, this is not about trying to create a successful agile experiment inside an IT department. This is about operating at the top of the organization saying, we don't want to just change your IT department. We don't want to help your software people write better software. We want to fundamentally change how your organization does business in the market because we believe this is not about IT. This is about being a better company. Yeah, yeah, Bob. In in reality, that, that judo move sometimes starts inside of IT and getting a single scrum team to run. But then you can you can you can begin to extrapolate from that what conditions had to be true. I had a, I had a persistent team with a really clear backlog, and we managed dependencies, created clearing conditions for that team to operate. And remember what a great project that was. What would it take to do that more broadly in another important part of the organization? So you it often starts the influence um, ladder often starts inside of a project with an IT. Um, but you build on it by connecting that to Mr. CEO, look at what this, look what we true in your organization if you could do this across the board. And here's what it would take to get there. And we're pragmatic about it. Let's just do it in the next most important thing. And then the next most important thing. And, and eventually prove that it's a better way to operate. Um, I, I think that the, I think you, you start where you have agency, but you grow that sphere of influence from that game all the time. It's the same, it's the same dropping. And like Leon was saying, Leon's building the snowball rolling uphill, right? It's the same thing. You're gaining advocates up if that's where, what it takes to get there. Where, where I've seen it happen, Bob, is where 
it's there's been a good experience and experiment. Again, executives aren't going to make big bets; they'll make small bets. So they might they make may, they might make a small financial bet on you to do an experiment. A lot of times in IT, as Dennis said, but then you got the execs thinking, right? Well, maybe this should be an agile project, right? Um, and and like and as there's more risk or as there's more things to it, they start thinking about that now. So now they're open to thinking about should this project be agile, and then maybe should we have agile teams and should they be persistent? It starts feeding into their thoughts. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. It's interesting what what, the, what you're saying because about my experience, and I'm I'm mostly uh, working both at teaching and consulting about uh, on on the executive levels in in corporations, and. Um, this thing that's agile is coming from the IT teams, uh, which is both, uh, it's a double-edged word. No, it's, it's, um, it, it depends on the storytelling. Uh, I think it's how you communicate the thing. But the, the way that I try to, to, to share that is the reason why agile is so powerful is because agile has shown benefits in uh, changing environments because IT and technology, digital technology, is an ever-changing uh, um, industry. So, and today, all, if not most, uh, most, if not all of the of the of the industries are in a, in this ever-changing environment. So, agile is perfectly adapted to that. The other side, and the other side of this world, is that. Uh, who are those geeks? Who are those nerds? Uh, who are those uh, people that just work in the silos and that they are telling us what we need to do, how do we need to work? And we are the executive, we are the all powerful and we are the management. And so, uh, yeah, I'm a proud nerd as well. And, and, and so I, I think it's how you bring the story to them in order to show them these benefits, going back to benefits, values, and showing that at the end, uh, and what, what has been working for me on that is saying who are or what are the biggest companies today uh, in, in the world? They are technological companies, they are digital companies, and they've been able to, to move in, in, uh, in, in, that, in, in that way. So that's a simplification of the system, but I think it's, it speaks a lot to the, to the executive and to, for them to understand why uh, Agile has some values for them and why they need to make that effort toward, towards uh, this, uh, uh, this, this, this change that they need to operate in their companies. But it's, it's totally transversal and that shouldn't be vertical and limited to the, to, to the IT department. Yeah, so I think, I think that's spot on, Cyril. I think it's really interesting um, when we, when we, when we, um, don't start the conversation. We start the conversation with, um, we don't, you don't understand your customer or you don't have a clearly articulated strategy or we, we have to start it in a language that supports what they're doing. You can't walk in and say, um, uh, here's how you need to run your organization to executives that have been running an organization. We can say all the things you're trying to do are the most important things. Here are some ways to do it better. That we've had results in it in what's a more fast changing, more technical, more technology integrated sort of thing. There's some things we have to do different. So, so it's it's interesting. You're right. That conversation and how you position it is incredibly, um, is incredibly significant and important. Because here's what happens in a lot of cases: doing this agile stuff becomes a moral um, argument, and we fight with executives that just don't get it. We don't move them in the direction we need to move them. Yeah, it's, it's such a good point. We're, we're dealing with that a little bit in our organization and we're trying to convince them there's a better way to do things when they're perfectly happy with how things are going because they can't keep up with the business. So that's an interesting conversation and in how you have that because when they think things are hunky-dory, even if you can't convince them they're not, I mean, you don't want to try to convince them they're not because that's the last thing you want to do is point out that they're wrong. That idea. That's right. it, it's, How can we go better? How can we take it here and make it even bigger? Yeah. Yeah. I want you shifting your weight the direction I need you to go, not not leaning against me early, right? So I can't I can't go start with language of loss, um, accusations of incompetence, um, blaming and fault finding and morality. Like that's just none of that language moves them in the direction we need them to move. 
So anything else, I've got to go get on an airplane. I hope this was worth y'all's time. I really appreciate everybody staying on. 46 people, that's a great audience. Um, reach out to Candace if you need to. And, um, and I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to y'all tonight. Thanks so much for your time, Dennis. I think at one point we had up to 53 people. So the last couple of minutes, we've had a few people drop off. Uh, thanks for your time and safe flights. Uh, we appreciate it. And everyone, if you haven't signed up on Agile Indy at the, uh, on the Agile Indy website for the May meeting, with uh, Woody Zool, uh, make sure and go out and, and get registered for that so that you can join us in May. Scott, anything else? Nope. All right, Good thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, thanks, Dennis. Take care. See you guys. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>